Well, good morning. morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. morning. Amen. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Uh, It's so good to be with you in the house of the Lord. It says in the Psalms, I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. My name is Reverend Brian Mercer. So good to be with you uh, on this second Sunday in July and what it means to be uh, people of the risen Lord. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Now, uh, it was my job this morning to turn on the AC and the whole unit. And so if you're doing this, that was my fault. I didn't get here until about 745. And so hopefully uh, we're going to cool down as we uh, worship the Lord uh, this day. And I hope I did it all right. So you know who to blame today if uh, it's too hot in here today. So good to be with you in the house of the Lord as uh, you come in and as we worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, Let me just say a a very overwhelming uh, thank you from my family, Shelly, Nick, and Laney. You guys have welcomed us in a beautiful way in the life of this church. This community has welcomed us, and we are slowly but surely becoming Mendonites, and that is an awesome thing. And so thank you from our family and from the Lord. Uh, Let's pray together as we begin worship this day. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your glory and your majesty. As we come into your house for corporate worship, Lord, uh, Lord, accept this praise offering that we give you this day. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us as we come to your throne as we come to your altar. Lord, as we lay down our busy and chaotic lives, as we come to you, Lord, to assess our priorities, rearrange them, and to allow you to be the very source of our strength and our hope, our refuge and our rock. And so, Lord, lead and guide us as we worship this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning in worship, we're preparing our hearts to hear the word of the Lord as we talk about being living stones and about believing in Christ, our cornerstone. And so this morning, we're going to begin with our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And so let's stand together. We're going to sing all five verses together.
remain standing and let's affirm our faith together as we affirm our faith before God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he arose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, I'd like to ask you to please make note of the special prayers and those that are listed in the nursing homes in the back of your bulletin. And I, I ask that you would um, pray for these people during the week as you have your personal prayer time and lift them up to the Lord. Also, many of you may have heard that Chief T.C. Bloxham has passed away. And I also ask that you lift that family up and Pam in your prayers also this week. His service will be Tuesday at First Baptist Church. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of life and love, we give thanks for this day and the opportunity to gather and worship to praise you. We come before you with eager hearts to be filled so that we may inspire others to walk in your ways. Scripture tells us that we are chosen and precious in your sight, and we are to show others your goodness. You claim us as your own, and we love because you first loved us. We want Christ's spirit in our hearts that spirit of love and goodness. We want our light to shine for you and to encourage others around us so that you are glorified in our lives and all that we do. We ask that you set us on fire with a love for you that is contagious to those around us. And may the spiritual fruit of our lives be rooted, rooted firmly in your love, mercy, and grace. And at those times when we fail or become discouraged, give us your grace to try again and press on. And if we lose our way, guide us back. All these prayers we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who prays with us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, guys, how y'all doing this morning? Y'all turn around and look at me. I know that maybe I might be doing things backwards this morning. Um, well, uh, do y'all know my name yet? No? Well, I'm glad you're honest. You know, uh, I, I don't know that I know all of your names, but I'm going to do my very best to learn your names, okay? I'm going to do my very best to know who you are when you walk through the door and you give me five, all right? Um, I got something with me today. 
that, uh, that is. That's right. It's rocks. Anybody want to take one, fill the one? These are holy rocks. Do you know what makes them holy? Does anybody know? Get you a rock or two. There you go. Does anybody know what makes them holy? Anybody want to guess? Preacher's kids, y'all don't get to guess. All right. Because God, well, that's right. God did make them a long, 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 long time ago. That's right. Anybody else want to guess why they're holy? Yes, sir. God created them. God created them. That's right. All right. What about you guys? you know why they're holy? Because they're from the Holy Land. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. And God gave us light. God gave us light. That's exactly right. Well, these rocks are, let me see one of them. These rocks are from the Holy Land. Uh, some of them are from the Jordan River. Uh, some of them are from Jesus' hometown city, Capernaum, uh, near the Sea of Galilee. Uh, some of these rocks actually uh, came from Greece and Mars Hill, which is where Paul preached and taught and talked to this, his followers about Jesus. And, uh, and so these are special rocks to me. They're in a drawer in our house. And I'm sure Shelly, my wife, wondered why we're moving rocks when we're moving from one house to another. It's because they're special. Uh, they're holy to me. They represent something meaningful. And I want you to know about you and your heart, all right? You are holy. You are special. You know why? Because you were created, like you said, God created these rocks because you were created by a holy God. And you are set apart. Now, what that means is, is you're chosen. Anybody ever played kickball or uh, four square? Anybody ever played volleyball? All right. In volleyball. All right, so we got teams, right? And you know how cool it is to be chosen? You know, where there are team captains and they say, I'll take you and I'll take you. Well, God is a team captain. And he has said to you and to me, I'll take you. Every one of us. He's chosen us. Just like I chose these rocks and took them out of the uh, Holy Land, uh, Jordan. I think that was okay. I don't know if I broke the law or not. But anyway, but just like I chose those rocks, God created you. And he chose you. And he said, you're mine and I am yours. And so when you go back to your pew, to your parents or your grandparents, your aunt or, aunt or uncles, I want you to say, I'm chosen. All right, deal? I'm chosen. I am God's. And uh, I'm holy because of where I came from. You know where you came from? Anybody know where you came? Where'd you come from? God. From God. That's exactly right. That's where you came from. And that Everybody. makes you whole. Everybody. That's exactly right. We might just have the sermon people right now because we got all the answers <laughs> right here. It's perfect. That's right. So I want you to remember. Now, if it's okay, I'm going to get you to give me those rocks back because they're pretty special to me. All right. Now, all right, I got one more thing I want to tell you before we leave. Now, last week, I told you how people called me nub when I was in college, and it's because of the way God made my hand. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed my hand yet? What do you think about that hand? It's kind of weird, isn't it? I see your face. It's kind of like, ooh. All right? All right, so, so I noticed that last week I didn't tell you what happened to my hand, did I? I told you all the thing, people that I like to tell, you know, like, you know, alligator bit it off. Do you think that happened? No, it didn't. Uh, and I told you that I, one day I was at Kentucky Fried Chicken and it was finger licking good and I just got carried away. Remember that one? That's the one everybody likes to hear. Actually, I was born just like this. I was born just like this. This is the way God, I guess, wanted me to be. And I really like it this way. But I thought that you could see it. Anybody want to touch it? All right. Just one brave soul. Two brave souls. Three brave souls. All right. Nick and Laney have to touch it all the time, so I want to ask them. All right, so I kind of like it. So you can call me, uh, you can call me Brian, or you can call me Brother Brian, or you can call me Brother B, or you can call me if you want to. Your parents might get mad at if you call me this, or you can call me Nub, okay? Deal? All right, let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks, Lord, that you have created us. Lord, and, and as much as uh, we need to hear this, you've created us just the way you want us. And God, as we look at your word this morning, as we talk about being living stones, Lord, let us know and remember that you've chosen us. You've chosen us and you've crafted us, just like these rocks are all different shapes and sizes. Lord, you've made us all shapes and sizes to be yours. And God, let us live as living stones. And Lord, let us have in this whole, whole space faith like these kids that are willing to come down here and sit with a preacher and learn about what it means to follow God. Uh, we give you thanks, Lord, and we pray this in Christ's gracious and holy name. Thank you guys for being here.
As we continue to listen for God's word, we're going to take up the offering now. And one of the things that you might remember about God's holy word and God's people is throughout all of God's time, we've been asked to uh, offer sacrifices and offer ourselves to give to the Lord. And so this is our opportunity this week to give to the Lord. And so uh, let us pray to the Lord that we would be cheerful givers. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for who you are, and we give you thanks for this holy opportunity, Lord, to give to you, give back to you what is already yours. Lord, bless these gifts, multiply them so that we might become your righteousness, and Lord, so that we might provide for the means of this church, and so that this church might grow the kingdom here in Minden and beyond. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. hymn of faith this morning is We Are God's People. It's out of this little book called The Faith We Sing. It's a supplemental hymnal for us. It's on page 2220 and we're going to sing all four verses together.
Let us remain standing. We're going to hear from the word of the Lord from uh, the disciple, Apostle Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 10. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to uh, open those. If you have your uh, phones with an app of the Bible there, you can open those as well and read along as we hear the word of the Lord this day. So Peter says uh, to those gathered around, As you come to him, the living stone... Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, the cornerstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. It's been a true joy praying for you and getting to know you. Uh, I know more names this week, I think, than I knew last week. Uh, You need to know this about me as your pastor. Uh, I'm just going to go for it whenever I meet you. Uh, If I think I know your name, I'm going to call you something. And uh, be careful, though, because some people are so polite to preachers, they just say, okay. And I might get trapped in calling you Terry when your real name is Robert. And so uh, please tell me if I call you by the wrong name. Uh, This morning, as we come to this passage of Scripture, as I've uh, sought the Lord this week, uh, I kept uh, reading this passage of scripture and thinking about what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was a kid. And so I asked you that question, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Think back, for some of you might have to close one eye to think this far back, but what did you want to be when you were a kid? What were your aspirations and dreams? You know, in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, when the teacher had, had you fill out a piece of paper, an assignment that said, this is what I want to be when I grow up. What was on that piece of paper? Uh, For me, I wanted to be the Lone Ranger. Uh, I wanted to be Kenny Rogers, mainly because Dolly Parton was the hottest thing since sliced bread, and Kenny got to stand next to Dolly. Uh, I wanted to be a chemical rep. Uh, What I mean by that is my dad was a farmer, and uh, we were always out in the field, hot sun, and and this chemical rep, this salesman would show up in his nice, shiny truck and uh, help us. And he'd have a button-down shirt on, clean jeans, and he'd help us for about 25 minutes. And he'd get back in his clean truck and he'd drive away. So I wanted to be a chemical salesman instead of a farmer. I didn't know it, but I wanted to be Shelly's husband. I didn't know it back then. I wanted to be the first one-handed golfer on the PGA Tour. And I tell you, I, I kind of still want to be that a little bit, although my days are drawing slight. I asked Brother Frank Jones, who's with us today, if it was okay if uh, I shared a story about him and his ministry in my home church. He preached there many years ago, not too many years ago, Brother Frank. But uh, there was a children's sermon at Mangum, just like there is a children's sermon here. And, and, uh, and this particular Sunday, uh, uh, Brother Frank asked all the kids to come down, and it was a couple of them, just like we had today. And Brother Frank asked that question, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And a couple of answers uh, wailed out. And finally, this little boy, who was about six or seven years old, named Chris, he said, I want to be a farmer. Yes, I want to be a farmer so I can ride around in my new truck all day, drink beer, and chew tobacco. (laughs) You remember that, Brother Frank? As his dad easily eased out the back door of the church. Truth is, we we want to be like those around us as we grow up, don't we? I would say most third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, they want to be what their dad, their granddad is, their uncle or their aunt. They want to be uh, what their heroes are. 
And that's normal. That's part of who we are. We're formed by those around us. Our sports figures, our celebrities, our professors, our coaches, our modern-day heroes. That's what forms us maybe into saying, this is what I want to be when I grow up. But our question uh, this morning before us, as we look at the disciple Peter's words, is what does God want for us to be? What does God desire for us to be in this journey that's called life? How does he desire for us to answer that question? I believe Peter has an answer for us. I believe in these words we have our, our call, our call to arms, our call to ministry. Uh, our identity is uh, found woven in these words and the many other words of the disciples and the apostles, the prophets and the teachers. So that's what I want us to look at. That, that, that's what I want us to look at today is what does God want for us to be? How does God answer that question? Imagine you're before God, just figuratively with me now. You're standing with the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, uh, the Alpha and the Omega. And he gives you a chance first to go and tell what you want to be in your life. He gives you a blank map and a pencil and says, write out what you're going to be in your life. Imagine how he would maybe chuckle at us. Imagine how he might would look at us and just shake his head and say, that's all? That's all you want to be? I believe the Lord wants much more for us than we actually set out to give for ourselves or identify for ourselves. This morning we have a passage of scripture who relays to us who we are, who relays to us who God is calling us to be. So last week I asked the question, who are we or who are you? This week, I'm just asking the question, who are you called to be? Who are you called to be as the people call Methodists here in Menden? Who are you called to be as followers of the one true God? I believe our answer is before us this day. So uh, Peter wrote this letter, uh, this uh, proclamation. Um, I told someone yesterday after leaving the Maddens three weeks before he was crucified upside down, but actually it was three years, Murray. Three years before he was crucified for his faith, he wrote this letter. And so we know it was somewhere toward the end of his life. Uh, some would call that, in, call that in his wisest days. He was able to write this letter after being and walking alongside Christ. The disciple Peter penned these words after following Jesus around the Sea of Galilee, through Samaria, and after following him to Jerusalem. The disciple Peter wrote these words after he had said, Never will I deny you, Jesus. And then we remember the story. Before the cock crowed twice, he denied him three times. He wrote this after being reinstituted there on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. You remember those words? John chapter 21. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. So I believe we have a word this morning that bears our ears to listen, that calls our ears and our hearts to say, who am I called to be? And what does God have to say about who he desires for me to be? You know that God gave us a promise. You remember Jeremiah 29, that might be one of your favorite scripture verses, for I know the plans, Jeremiah the prophet says, that the Lord spoke through him, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope, and a future. Maybe that was what Peter was thinking of when he penned those words. Verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Brothers and sisters of Christ here in Menden, I need you to know this this morning. God has a plan for your life. God has a call on your life. God's placed before you an identity, and it's just waiting there for you to embrace it waiting for you to take hold of it, waiting for you to say, this is who I am in Christ, and this is who I'm called to be. You know, from the time of Moses, God designed a place of worship for his people. Uh, actually, here in 1 Peter, we're reading some of the remnants of the Old Testament. See, I lay a stone, a cornerstone in Zion. Uh, those who rejected uh, those the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's all beautiful language from the Old Testament here for us. You remember God gave the Hebrew people exact measurements for both the tabernacle and the temple. And God says that 
we are here in 1 Peter, the building blocks of that temple. I want to say this because it is rich. It is rich where we stand this morning. We stand before a living God who says he wants to build us into a spiritual house. You know, buildings are important to us, aren't they? Uh, many of us, uh, when we think of home, we think of our house. When we think of the house of God, what do we think of? Here. We think of buildings as places of security, of, of launching pads. I think of buildings as launching pads for ministry. I, I'm so excited about what's happening here in the life of our church and how we're revamping and redoing our children's facility as a launching pad for great ministry out into this world and this community. Not just for us, but a launching pad for ministry. And so Peter uses this language, that we are living stones, that we are part of what God's building on this earth to glorify Him, to praise Him, and to feed people, to clothe people, to see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And so we are called, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be living stones. That's who we're called to be, living stones. Living stones in the framework of what God is building on this earth, part of this beautiful structure, part of this beautiful living and breathing body of Christ. Paul says it as if we're an arm or an ear or a leg, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one body, many parts. Peter uses this building language to say that we're a part of the great framework of what God is doing. And so this morning you might say, okay, Brian, I'm a, I'm a living stone. What does that mean? H how can I be a living stone for us? If we're very literal, then we're thinking, you know, stones don't talk, Brian. Stones don't walk. Stones don't feed. But do they? Remember what Jesus said, that if, that if the people of Jerusalem didn't cry out, that the stones, the rocks would cry out as he came and wept over Jerusalem as he descended into Jerusalem for that final week. For me and you to be living stones, this is what it means. First, it means that we are a chosen stone. We're a chosen stone. Just as I spoke about these holy rocks that I possibly stole from the Holy Land, we're chosen stones, crafted and carved for God's great purposes. We're essential to the body of Christ, to the framework have you ever played Jenga? Raise your hand if you've played Jenga in here. Jenga, J-E-N-G-A. Jenga is a game where you put all these blocks together and one by one you pick out a plank. One by one. And the object of the game is not to be the sore loser like me that picks out the last one. Imagine. Imagine that great structure, Jenga, or a great wall that has bricks, stones missing from all over and how fragile a wall can be when its core stones are missing. That is the body of Christ picture for me this morning, that we all are needed to be a part of the great structure, the great temple that the Lord is building here on this, work, this earth. So you are a chosen stone. It says it there in verse 9 if you're following along, but you are a chosen people. You know, being chosen does wonders for our self-image. Do you remember being on one of those teams where you were chosen first? I really don't remember being chosen first, to be real honest with you. I remember being chosen middle or last. But being chosen does wonders for our self-image. We're wanted. We're needed. Uh, we are chosen. I had a youth in my youth ministry a number of years ago. His name was Garrett Terry, is Garrett Terry. And, uh, Garrett, uh, you know, when we uh, introduce ourselves to someone, sometimes they ask us to attach a, uh, you know, a, an adverb or an adjective. And so I might be Bodacious Brian, right? BB. And so uh, Garrett would be Goofy Garrett because Garrett was just always goofy. One of those guys that's really smart, but common sense, just somewhere it got messed up there in the making. Garrett, when he was in junior high, uh, uh, Garrett Terry, uh, uh, he was in junior high, seventh or eighth grade. I don't remember the. The, the principal came over the loudspeaker and said, uh, would all the GT students, would all the GT students please come to the cafeteria for a special time? Well, all the gifted and talented students got up and they started to walk out the door and Garrett along with them started walking out the door and the teacher said, Garrett, where are you going? Are you, are you a GT student? She said, yes, ma'am, that's my initials, uh, uh, Garrett Terry. 
He told that story to me because he said, finally, I was honored. I had been chosen to be one of the GT students. They had realized that that was my initials. Being chosen matters. Being chosen, being chosen is important to who we are and to our identity. And for some reason, brothers and sisters, we get all mixed up because we think there's so many of us, so many followers of Christ, that we think to ourselves, oh, I really don't matter. That, oh, it's not important that I go to church today. It's not important that I go to that ramp build on Tuesday night. It's not important that I be at that council meeting or that thing that my church is doing, or maybe even, even uh, with more consequences. It's not important that I tell my neighbor about Christ. It's not important that I make sure that my coworkers know the Lord and know where my joy comes from. You are a chosen stone. Chosen. God needs you. God desires for you to be a part of this beautiful, beautiful structure that he's building called the body of Christ here on earth. A chosen and holy people. He says this, Peter says this to the Gentiles, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I may say it a thousand times to you as your preacher, you're God's plan to reach the people. You're God's plan for, to reach the world in grace, love, and mercy. Who are we called to be? We're called to be followers who embrace our chosenness, who know how very special it is, how very unique it is to be chosen. For some reason in our mind, uh, you know, limited edition uh, artwork, limited edition baseball collector cards or bats, they go for thousands, maybe millions of dollars because they're limited edition so in our minds, we think because there's no limit to the number of people God chooses, then we're not that special. But oh, the contrary. God knows each one of us by name. You may be the only church, Shelley taught me, my wife. You may be the only church anyone ever goes to. You may be the only Bible anybody ever reads. You're a chosen stone, unique and gifted for that place in the temple that God is building on this earth. Your kindness, your love, your generosity, your truth may be the very stone needed to bring someone else into a part of being a part of this great holy temple tabernacle that Jesus, that God is building in Jesus Christ. So the word says in verse 9 that we're a chosen stone. And then the word says that we're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Now, I'm just curious, anybody in here want to raise your hand and say you're a priest? Anybody in here want to be brave enough to do that? I don't know that I'm even brave enough to do that. A royal priesthood. Peter here gives us a peek into the Old Testament when Levi priests were the only ones worthy, called to stand before God. Remember your Old Testament uh, knowledge and study? Under the old covenant that God made with his people, the Hebrew people, in the desert with Moses, there were the sons of Aaron, and then the tribe of Levi. This tribe, uh, they were called the, the Holy Ones. And they were the ones. This is what they did. Uh, they had direct access to God, the holy priests did. The priests, uh, they were the ones that had direct access in the holy, holy, holy of Holies once a year to make intercession for the people. The priest offered sacrifices to God for the sins of the people. I'm telling you this so that you'll hear the weight of who we are. Peter reveals to God's people, us, Gentiles and Jews alike, then and now the truth is that Jesus Christ calls us to be living stones, a royal priesthood. We have direct access to God. We make our confession to God. You don't need me or anyone else because you are a royal priest. We bring our gifts and sacrifices to God because Christ has interceded for us. So you're wondering, how did I get to be a royal priest? I kind of understand maybe a chosen stone, but how did I get to be a royal priest? Because Jesus intercedes to the Father for you and for me. You remember the Simon and Garfunkel song? Like a bridge over troubled waters. That's who Jesus is. And because he's the bridge over troubled waters for me and for you, we are a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood called to speak God's grace, love, and mercy. I'm not the only one in Minden 
that's called a Methodist, me and Reverend Boggs, that should be the ones going to the hospital or telling others about Christ. You are a royal priesthood. I am a royal priesthood. Holy, chosen to be those who spread the goodness. We said it last week, the aroma of Christ to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. So this morning, I just want you to know I anoint you. I bless you. If you need the preacher to do that, I'll do it right now. Go and be priests. Go and be pastors. Go and be ministers. One of the things we've done in the church over the last centuries is we have, uh, and I'm, I'm excited about this, we have uh, paid preachers to go and do the work of the church. And what that caused sometimes is people to say, well, that's what our preacher does, or that's what our pastor does. No, we all are royal priests. We all are those set apart, chosen by God, to go and tell of the goodness of who God is. A royal priesthood. In Australia, when Australia celebrated the turning of the century, you remember what we called that, Y2K? When Australia celebrated the turning of the century, the new millennium, they had this brilliant uh, light show there in Sydney. And as a climax or as the finish, the, the triumphant uh, finale of this light show, there on one of the major bridges in Sydney, uh, lit up the word eternity. Just one word, eternity. That's how they rang in the new millennium, uh, Y2K, the turning of the century. Nine months later, this same word appeared in Sydney during the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, eternity eternity. Do you know where they got this word from? I mean, obviously God's word. But do you know why that became a national symbol for the citizens of Australia? Back in 1884, there was a man named Arthur Stace who was born. He was raised in a brewery. He was raised in a house with severe alcoholics. He became a severe alcoholic, uneducated, one day he went to a Bowery mission just to get some food and some water, sustenance for the week. He and fellow, uh, I guess you'd say maybe winos, were there, the 1930s. And as they sat there in this uh, uh, church building, they saw about 10 or 15 men up at the front who were dressed nice, had their hair combed. And this guy, author, said, what do those guys have that I don't have? I, I think I'll take a run at what they got, was his words. He went up and he asked them who they were, and they were followers of Christ. They were Christians. He said, how do I become a Christian? And they led him to the Lord that day. He went outside the doors of the church, and he prayed for God to heal him and to restore him. Miraculously, that um, horrible disease of alcoholism left him. He later went to an evangelistic meeting, and the preacher, the preacher began to talk about eternity. And the preacher shouted, eternity, eternity, I wish I could shout it to all the streets of Sydney, eternity. And Arthur says that his heart was touched. He had a piece of chalk in his pocket, and he just wrote it there where he was on the sidewalk, eternity. Starting that day, he would wake up each morning at 5.30 in the morning, have his prayer time and devotional time, go out into the streets of Sydney and find a place to write the word eternity. It's estimated that he wrote the word eternity 500,000 times on the streets of eternity to the point to where the mayor and city officials began to wonder who this mysterious prophet was who was proclaiming the good news of the gospel to the town, city of Sydney, eternity. You are a royal priesthood. Arthur Stace would have never said that he was a priest but he became a good news bearer because of his conviction that God had chosen him. God had laid on his heart a passion to tell others about the truth of the gospel and the truth of eternity. A chosen stone, a royal priesthood stone. And we are holy stones, verse 9 says, of a holy nation. Holy stones of a holy nation. This morning I just want you to know that your allegiance... Your allegiance not only lies as a citizen of one of the greatest nations in the world, the greatest nation in the world, but your citizenship, Peter says, and Paul says, and God says, is to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of the one who is risen from the dead, Jesus Christ. You're a chosen stone, 
a royal priesthood, and a holy stone of a holy nation. Now, brothers and sisters, does our nation here in this country feel very holy now? It doesn't, does it? As I listen to you talk and visit with me and as I visit with you, one of the, one of the strands that knows no city or knows no denomination or knows no ethnicity is that our nation is in trouble. And I want you to know that as we live into being holy, chosen stones, royal priests, then our nation, our physical nation, our country, will be great again as we embrace our holy citizenship in our Lord. That's part of being a great American, I believe, is being a great holy priest, knowing that we are a chosen stone and a chosen nation. So I just ask you, where does your allegiance lie? Not only with our great country, but also with our great Lord, part of that holy tabernacle that God is building here on earth. So God needs me and you. I so am honored to be your pastor. I think I've said that plenty of times already, and I'm going to continue to say it. But I need not be the only person here in this church, and I know I'm not, proclaiming the goodness of who God is, telling others about Christ, saying, hey, why don't you come to church because I believe in the transformational message of the gospel. You are a royal priest, and I pray that we'll all go out and proclaim that to the nations. I found uh, this letter that was written by a young pastor in Zimbabwe. He was later martyr martyred for his faith. I want you to hear it. It's a passionate letter. He says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, positions, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer and labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, Hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must keep going until he comes, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. I'm a holy nation, a chosen stone, a royal priesthood. My banner will be clear. This is the good news. This is the good news of Christ's followers. This is the good news for you here, for us here in Menden this day. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your calling upon our life. Lord, uh, many of us wonder what will we be. Many of us say jokingly sometimes, Lord, yeah, when I grow up, even when we're 40 or 50, we say that. Lord, we thank you that you've placed before us here through the apostle disciple Peter who we are, who you so desire for us to be. Lord, this day we may we embrace our identity. May we know who you've called us to be. And may we live, Lord, as living stones. May we be those rocks that Jesus spoke of that cry out on behalf of our one and true God and the teacher and savior that we follow, Jesus Christ. Lord, you increase in our lives. Allow us to decrease as we become your righteousness. Lord, we give you thanks for calling us to be living stones. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
This morning, our hymn of commitment is number 545, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, Our Lord. And uh, this morning, we're going to sing this uh, with loud and full voices, I'm sure. During the singing of this uh, hymn of faith or commitment, I invite you uh, to uh, recommit your life to being a living stone. If you've never committed your life to Christ, profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do so during the singing of this last hymn. If you want to come and share with me about what God's doing in your life, I'd love to celebrate that. If you'd like to become a member of this great church family, I invite you to come and to uh, join uh, the fellowship of what we that are called Menden Methodist and see what God has in store for uh, us in the future and the present, what God's doing here in this great church. Uh, let's stand together and sing all verses of this hymn. This morning, uh, our family would like to join uh, here at uh, First United Methodist Church of Minden. Um, as a pastor and ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, my membership 
uh, lies and is in uh, the annual conference of Louisiana. And so my membership status will not change, but I, I think my wife wants to join your church. Is that okay, everybody? And uh, my kids. And so, uh, so uh, uh, all three of you have been baptized, and so we receive your Christian baptism. This is the first time I've ever done this. This is really unique, isn't it, when it's with your family. And so uh, uh, I just ask you to profess your faith in Christ again. Do you profess, Nick and Laney and Shelley, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace, love, and mercy and promise to serve him as your Lord. You do that? And uh, will you uh, be loyal and a faithful member of First United Methodist Church Minden, the United Methodist Church and the Church Universal, the Kingdom of God, and support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Will you do that? And uh, will you walk alongside the Mercers? I think your round of applause already kind of affirms this. But will you walk alongside our family, my family, in Christ's Holy Church? And with us, and allow us to join you in uh, doing the work of the gospel, growing the kingdom by following Jesus Christ here in Menden. Will you, uh, will you do so? If you will, say, absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Welcome to the life of this church. Thank you all for welcoming us to the life of this church. A couple of things that I want you to know about. Uh, first of all, the mission trip to, um, I believe, somebody remind me where our ramp trip was going. Does anybody here know? Where was our ramp ministry headed? Missouri. To Missouri. That trip is being uh, rescheduled, canceled, uh, refocused. Uh, now, during the second week in August, the ramp ministry is going to do work here in uh, Minden. Uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, we're going to do work around the church. I say we because I'm going to do it with them. We're going to do work around the community of Minden. And so I want you to note that in the bulletin it's wrong. I was asking you to pray and join that root mi ramp ministry and their trip to Missouri. So I'd like for you to make that change there in the bulletin. Also this week, um, our beloved Mad Camp is here at our church. And so I want you to know about that. And uh, Dr. Gay, she is doing a wonderful job in uh, leading us again. So uh, I just encourage you if, you, uh, if you don't know what Mad Camp is, just show up tomorrow morning at about 8.30 and I think you'll quickly find out. My kids are excited about being here. Also, Weekend of the Cross, our youth ministry, 19 teenagers and some adults are going. We need a male chaperone to go with us uh, to Weekend of the Cross. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday night, I believe 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th. If you'll do that with us, Come see Jamie. Uh, we know that the Lord's going to provide, and so we need a male chaperone. And then my last announcement, announcement, I promise, the last couple of days of uh, July and into August is our vacation Bible school. I know Jamie and myself, we need your help. And so if you'd like to help with VBS, please see us. If you want your kids, grandkids, nephews, kids down the street to come, come sign them up or just bring them. So excited to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. Let's receive this sending forth and benediction. May the Lord bless you and may keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his beautiful face upon you, and give you peace. May all that we have and all that we are, may we give it to Christ and to his service. Amen. Amen.